Thanks. This is Jane White with Dirk Bergerman and Tibor Hoyman. I think we have a different title in the program, but it's the same talk. This is the first time I've given it. We're still uh, uh, moving around a little bit on how we uh, place it in the literature. Okay, so um, in digital advertising, there's a basic question about a well known basic question about efficiency versus competition. Publishers of, of advertise face publishers of advertising face this basic economic trade off. Uh, concerning uh, how finally they want to define impressions or how much information they want to provide uh, advertisers with. More, in, more information is going to imply a more efficient match between advertiser and viewer, so there's more surplus to split between the publisher and advertiser, uh, but more information gives rise to a thinner market if you're selling uh, the impression to the, the, if there's just a unique person left who's interested in that viewer, then you're going to be losing some, uh, the advertiser is going to be losing some information rent. So this is a basic trade-off. Uh, Levin and Milgram used the term conflation, uh, taking this example and more generally actually posing the more general question that this is a fundamental question in all of economics. We talk as if it's obvious how to define a good, but there's, you know, there's always some uh, definition, some uh, decision about how finally to partition uh, what's treated as a different good in the market, okay? So if you look at it from the seller's point of view, the question is, as a seller, how much information would you like buyers, in the case of digital advertising, the advertisers, to have about the good that they're buying, okay? So, uh, uh, so that's the question. Um, actually, it, you know, you can talk about this as if there's a common good being sold, but actually when you have different buyers, they can be given different information uh, in this trade-off. So which viewers are bundled for which uh, advertiser um, may differ. You can differ, you can uh, vary uh, who gets pooled for different advertisers, okay? So our question is how much information would the seller like the buyers to have about their valuations of a good in an auction, okay? a lot to maximize efficiency, a little to maximize competition, or something in between, okay? So let me describe this question um, in a clean abstract setting in a little bit more detail before I tell you the answer. So consider the classic problem of selling a single good in a second price auction to a collection of buyers, finite set of buyers with symmetric independent private values. Okay, you can't think of a simpler auction set setting, I guarantee it. Okay, but suppose the seller could control how much each buyer knows about his own private value. The seller has the ability to control this without knowing the private value himself. Okay, so the question was, does the seller like full information, no information or something in between? Uh, we've already described the trade-off. So the answer is uh, something in between. Okay, the particular thing in between that is optimal for the seller uh, is that you will let low valuation buyers know their values. They can be fully informed of their values, uh, but high valuation buyers are going to be pooled. So in particular, if one individual's value is above a critical threshold, he's told that it's above that threshold, but he is told nothing else. Okay, that's it, that's the answer. Uh, Actually, a, uh, uh, a curiosity is that actually the critical place at which pooling starts is actually a certain quantile of the distribution of values. The critical quantile will depend on the number of buyers, but it will not depend on the distribution of values. Okay, so there's a quantile that depends on the number of bidders only. Okay, and the intuition for this is that, uh, uh, and and one sec and below the threshold there is full revelation. Correct. Okay, that's the answer. Okay, and, and the intuition is that competition is lowest when there's a high winning value. When you have a high winning value, you don't expect there to be somebody close to you, so you'll be getting a lot of information rent. Uh, whereas if you have a low value, um, your competition is likely to be closer. There's less information rents associated with that. Okay. So that's it. Uh, so that's our main theoretical results and the first main contribution of the paper. So 
the title that I gave you had selling impressions in it. And I started the talk by talking about the market for digital advertising. Okay, how did that result, that abstract result that I just described to you, what does that have to do with digital advertising? Okay, <clears throat> so um, hopefully that's a clean and striking result, but there obviously might be some extra steps involved to relate it to digital advertising. Okay, well, a stylized view of the market impressions is that we have two-sided information. The publisher or seller knows about some attributes of the viewer who he's selling to the advertiser. The advertiser or the buyer uh, knows which attributes he's interested in. So the publisher can control that. So this is more complicated than the model I described, but the publisher can control the information that the advertiser has about the value of the impression by controlling the advertiser's access to information about attributes that he needs in order to derive his valuation of the good. Okay, uh, Advertisers' values of impressions, you might think, would typically be correlated. Uh, that wasn't the assumption I made. Uh, we can certainly think of reasons why they're correlated. However, they will be independent under some reasonable conditions if it's the case that um, variation across advertisers and across viewers is horizontal, okay? So there's symmetry and attributes and preferences across viewers and bidders, um, then they will turn out to be independent, okay? So uh, that, according to that slide, via the argument in that slide, our claim, I claim our result applies to the market for impressions, okay? So you can trust me on this, or I could uh, back it up a little bit so the second main contribution to the paper is that we are going to describe a stylized model of the market for impressions with two-sided information and uh, show that this richer model does reduce to the first model that I described and the first result. Okay, so that's the plan for the talk. Any questions? I like questions. Yeah, let me jump in with a question from the Q&A from the audience. So Andrew Rao asks, uh, in this example, why does it matter that we tell the low valuation buyers their true value? Uh, and I think the idea here is that if they're unlikely to win, then it shouldn't matter if they know this. Yes. So a point that's going to come up later is that it's uh, at very low values. It really it, it matters increasingly less what you do. Uh, but they will sometimes win. Uh, it will sometimes be the case that the number of guys you're pooling is very small, um, in which case you do care about knowing your values. So yes, so it's true that it's less valuable to the bidders to have that information, but we're asking whether the seller wants to give it to them or not. Okay. I, I see, we'll probably learn how, uh, how often we're doing pooling once we learn what quantile it is that is independent of the distribution at which you pool. Yes, very good. So um, if I had uh, an hour long talk, I would tell you the main result and talk about the market for impressions. Uh, that we may, it may get a little tight on the second part, but I hope I'll have time to tell you some stuff about that. Okay, so the main result. So N bidders, private values symmetrically and independently distributed according to F, um, a symmetric information structure uh, so we will be focusing on the case where the seller can pick uh, an information structure, which is going to be the same. Each bidder's information about his own value um, is going to take the same form. His signal is going to take the same form across bidders. Uh, so that an information structure will generate a distribution over expected values. A well-known result, going back to Blackwell and Strassen and Rothschild Stiglitz made it famous to economists, um, is that there exists a signal, some information that players could receive about their values that generates as given distribution of expected valuations G from distribution of values F, if and only if F is a mean preserving spread of G. Okay, where this is the uh, well-known definition of a mean preserving spread of G. Okay, and we'll use this uh, notation for mean preserving spread. Okay, so revenue in a second price auction. So by the way, the results will extend to other standard auctions. It's just simpler to see it all in the case of a second price auction. 
So the second order statistic of n symmetrically and independently distributed value random variables has a certain formula that looks like this. The expected revenue is just the uh, expected value of the second order statistic. So the problem we want to solve is just maximizing expected revenue subject to uh, the majorization constraint that the distribution G, um, that F is a mean preserving spread of the distribution G, okay? So that's a maximization problem. Uh, unfortunately, it's nonlinear in the optimization variable G, so uh, might be messy, uh, not concave, not convex. Okay, so Jason should like this. Um, the change of variables to quantiles turns out to be 100% the secret of solving this problem, and it makes it very well behaved. Okay, so donate by QI, a random variable that's uni uniformly distributed on zero one uh, to be interpreted as the quantile of the distribution. So each value is going to be associated with the quantile QI in the distribution like this. Okay. Uh, notice that the quantile corresponding to the second highest valuation, we can work out what's the distribution of the quantile associated with the second highest valuation. It's going to look like this. An important property is that this distribution uh, has nothing to do with the underlying distribution of G or F, just like the, the um, quantile is automatically uniformly distributed by definition, the uh, quantile of the second order statistic of independent variables is distributed like this automatically. It's nothing to do with the underlying distributions. Okay. So we can write down revenue as the, with this change of variables, as the expectation over quantiles using the measure of the second order statistic. Okay, so the revenue uh, for some given quantile of the second order statistic is G minus I of that quantile. It's the value associated with the quantile. So our maximization problem can be rewritten like this. We're choosing G, but we can think about choosing the inverse of G uh, uh, in order to maximize revenue. It's a famous, uh, property that we can rewrite. If F is a mean preserving spread of G, then G minus one is a mean preserving spread of F minus one. Okay. And this objective is linear in G minus one. That's what we bought by mapping into quantile space. It's made it a well-behaved problem. I see. Okay. Okay, so here's the solution. I'll tell you how we get there in a second. Suppose that F is absolutely continuous. Actually, we can deal with not absolutely continuous, but it's easier to state this way. Uh, then the unique optimal information structure is the one that I described, that your signal, you're told your value if the quantile associated with that value is below some critical threshold and you're simply, your signal, which you're identifying with your expected value is simply equal to the expected value conditional on your uh, quantile being above that critical quantile, okay? So you reveal the valuation to all those bidders who have valuation lower than a threshold determined by this quantile uh, and otherwise reveal no information, okay? People sometimes call this upper censorship. You uh, this information structure, okay? So again, the intuition is that this optimal information structure will support competition at the top of the distribution, even though there'll be inefficient allocation at the top of the distribution. When you're in that range, that will sometimes, the good will sometimes be inefficiently allocated, bundles together, uh, everybody above the threshold in a single mass point, okay? So information rent of the winning bidder is significantly depressed to more than compensate for the inefficiency of the allocation. All right, so uh, let me give an intuition for the proof. Um, so here's one 
intuitive way of seeing how you get from the result, get to the result. Uh, this was the revenue that you wanted to maximize. Uh, integration by parts gives us this expression. So an equivalent representation of the problem is that we want to minimize this expression subject to this majorization constraint. Okay, this is um, starting to look like problems that we're familiar with. Um, uh, okay, so um, let's look at the distribution of the second order statistic in quantile space. Here's the graph of the distribution of the second order, order of the quantile of the second order statistic for n equals three. Uh, it looks like this, uh, but it's more generally going to be the pop fact, going to have the property that for any n, it's going to have a unique inflection point. So it's going to have this um, uh, convex concave shape. Okay, uh, we're trying to minimize an expression, but via that integration by parts, we're going to be interested in finding what is the largest convex function below the uh, uh, second order distribution. Okay, well, that's just going to be this, given the shape of that, that's simply going to be uh, this dotted red line here, where the critical Q, the critical quantile, um, is going to be solving that uh, uh, tangent point condition. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to want to do for that minimization problem is we're going to want to take the mass of F minus one and um, uh, spread it to the extremes of the affine segment if we're trying to minimize, okay? Uh, holding the mean quantile constant. Okay, so going back to the value distribution, suppose we take some value distribution. Uh, so here the value, the CDF of the value is root V. What we're gonna want to do is we're gonna look at those critical, those, uh, uh, critical endpoints of the affine region that we identified on the uh, uh, convexification of the second order statistic. And in the space of F minus one, we're going to spread mass to those two points. So G minus one is going to correspond to the dotted line here. And now uh, we are in the space of quantiles was the change of variables, but we want to map it back into the distribution. So if we think about uh, reversing these axes here, uh, we're going to get um, the this F, the blue line was the, the CDF of F, and G is then going to take this form, uh, which is the uh, G that I told you about, okay, fully revealing up to a point and then a point mass somewhere in between. Okay. Now that was a slightly informal argument. Uh, this problem is an example of character, you know, uh, uh, you get there by characterizing the extreme points of monotone functions subject to a majorization constraint. Uh, a recent econometrica paper by Kleiner et al. has a general characterization of those problems, so you can just directly verify that their conditions hold for the proposed solution that I told you. Jason was interested in where the quantile came from. Uh, well, algebraically, so it will be the case that the quantile on this, I should have made n, I should have put an n subscript on the um, S distribution, this, that distribution depends on N, okay? Uh, algebraically, we saw, um, sorry, geometrically, we saw this expression for what the critical Q must be. Um, it turns into an nth degree polynomial in Q. We can verify that when N equals two, the solution is to give no information. Uh, but then the critical quantile increases and it increases to one as you go to infinity. Okay, where does it come from? Uh, a very quick intuition is economic intuition for what does that mean? A very quick variational intuition we can give is say, suppose you fix a quantile threshold Q and write V lower bar 
for the value associated with that quantile and write V upper bar for the expected value conditional on being above that quantile. And we can ask the question conditional on V greater than or equal to V lower bar, what is the gain of increasing the threshold by epsilon? I'm missing a bullet point here. It should say conditional on V greater than or equal to V bar, um, what's the impact of changing uh, the threshold up by epsilon, okay? Well, the probability of getting the high payment, that is of the second highest value being above the threshold is going to be approximately this. This is the probability of the second order statistic being above the threshold um, divided by the probability of the first order statistic being above the threshold. Okay, and the increase in payment you can work out if we've increased Q by epsilon, it's going to be of order epsilon V upper bar minus V lower bar. Okay, so there's an increase. There's a probability that a high payment will get made, and there's going to be an increase in payment by increasing that threshold. Okay, but there's also going to be a loss. There's going to be a probability that if you increase the threshold by epsilon, that instead of getting that high payment, you will uh, be uh, jumping down to the now fully revealed value. Okay, so that happens with this probability, the probability of low payment, and the decrease of payment is going to be from V upper bar to V lower bar. Okay, so if you equate those two, uh, you will uh, get the first order condition that we satisfied. So that's an intuition for where the quantile comes from. Okay, and this is what the critical quantile looks like. Uh, this is for fixed n. It makes it a little hard to interpret. Um, I'm not going to have time to talk about it, but we have results for um, uh, large markets, uh, uncertainty about the number of bidders, uh, fat tail distributions, and so on. So this is the basic insight, but you can map it into richer models to think about what happens in a large market. Any questions about that? So let me spend five minutes uh, just talking about the market impressions. Any questions about that first? So it looks like you're pretty likely to be sending it to someone who is uh, in this upper interval with these numbers. Yes. I can't remember if we worked out what the probability is. Yeah, we could work out what's the expected. What's like the uh, expected number is like two. And yeah, maybe it's of that order of magnitude. I think it is of that order of magnitude. Uh, you know, one exercise that we do is uh, consider the limit as n goes to infinity, but there's random entry. And we can ask whether you want to pool or not. Uh, we let n go to infinity, a probability of entry, and but holding the uh, expected number of bidders constant. And there, the critical number is 1.79. So if the expected number of bidders is uh, uh, less than 1.79, you want to pool uh, uh, completely uh, to get competition with such a small number of bidders. But as the expected number of bidders goes above 1.79, you will start to reveal more. Okay, so what's this got to do with the market for impressions? Okay, well, here are, there are people here who know much more about the market for impressions than, than uh, uh, certainly I do, and I will dare say we do. Um, so, but uh, roughly speaking, private information and digital advertising takes a particular distributed form. The viewer or the object uh, of the auction has many attributes, his demographics, past browsing behavior, past purchase behavior, and so on. Uh, the publisher uh, or intermediary who's selling uh, advertising uh, has private information about the attributes of the viewer that he's selling. The advertiser as a bidder has private information about his, uh, what he cares about. So it, his preferences over the attributes of the viewers. Okay, so the value of the impression or the value of the match between the advertiser and the viewer is jointly determined by these different sources of private information, okay? So um, we were discussing this earlier. Uh, it's not exactly clear why auctions are used, but auctions are used in practice. 
um, sometimes the second price auction, as I said, are theoretical results generalize. Um, and uh, the publisher in some form generates information for advertisers by combining their reported preferences with the publisher's attribute information. This takes place in some form. Uh, two variants that are uh, talked about are auto bidding. L let me just talk about auto bidding actually right now. So advertisers report their preferences to the publisher. The publisher commits to submitting advertiser optimal bids conditional on reported preferences. Okay, so we'll focus on this case. Um, so uh, we can think about a formal model where the viewer has some attributes X, the advertiser has some preferences over attributes YI, is advertiser I's preferences. Suppose these things are independently distributed. Suppose the value of a viewer is a function of these two different inputs. This model is going to induce a distribution F over the final value VI of the advertiser, okay? Uh, suppose we make some statistical assumptions that the advertiser's preference tells him nothing about others' valuation of the object and the publisher's knowledge of viewer attributes tells him nothing about valuations, okay? So more specifically, uh, yeah, let me just say it in words, okay? We make that statistical assumption, okay? Uh, we can provide a micro-founded model where attributes are just a list of binary characteristics, preferences uh, are a list of binary attributes that you care about that can justify those statistical assumptions, okay? So uh, we think that these statistical assumptions are not crazy. Then we can model auto-bidding by saying the publisher commits to a signal generated conditional on the advertiser's reported preferences and the viewer attributes. The publisher commits to submitting an advertiser optimal bid as a function as reported preference and the publisher's signal. And then preferences and attributes are realized, preferences are reported to the advertiser, signals and bids are realized, and the impression is allocated to the highest bidder at the second highest price. Okay, that's a model of auto bidding in this market for impressions, uh, we show that advertisers have an incentive to truthfully report their preferences in this auto bidding mechanism. Okay, under the, in the setup that we have, under the statistical assumptions that we've made, they do have an incentive to truthfully report their preferences. So that means that in this model of auto bidding, the uh, analysis and conclusions do map back to our main result. And I'll stop there because I'm late. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I think we can again take a, a question. Um, and while uh, we're waiting for that question to come in, I wanna make a quick announcement. So uh, both Stephen and Eva are happy to entertain follow-up discussion about this in, uh, in the virtual chair conference platform uh, after this. And I will post a link in the chat in case, uh, in case you don't have it handy. But we encourage everyone to come uh, come join in, in virtual chair for additional follow up after after the next question. Um, any any further questions from the audience? It's a little quick at the end. Sorry. Yeah, I was actually, um, you went pretty fast over this model that sounded uh, of, that, you know, gave you your independence property that you were hoping for. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, let me say that I think that um, the model is more general. Uh, this type of model with two-sided signals of what's going on is of more general interest. And there are um, uh, some further questions that we've tried to answer and further questions that other people could answer, recognizing the fact that there is this two-sided information. What I told you about was um, some informational assumptions that really says that this information is very separate and that you need both pieces of information together and by themselves, they're not valuable. It is under those statistical assumptions that um, 
we get back to the very clean benchmark result that I told you. Um, uh, it's a very interesting direction to go to relax those assumptions, in which case, presumably, some of the insights will go through and others will be adjusted. 